Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Kirkwood City Council meeting this evening. I ask everyone to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mayor Griffin? Here. Councilmember Ward? Here. Councilmember Wirtz? Here. Councilmember Gibbons? Here. Councilmember Sears? Here. Councilmember Dewey? Here. Councilmember Zimmer? Here. Thank you. We'll go straight to our public hearings. We have two this evening. First one is a request for allocation of $46,800 in community de development block grant funds, which will become available after January 1st, 2000. 22. Mr. Hessel, do you wish to enter any exhibits into the record? I would, Mayor. I would offer as Exhibit 1 the affidavit of publication verifying notice of, of this public hearing appeared in the St. Louis County. And exhibit 2 is the affidavit of publication verifying notice of public hearing appeared in the Webster Kirkwood Times. And Exhibit 3 is the Code of Ordinances of the City of Kirkwood. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hawes, who will present this to the City Council? That would be the City's Assistant Chief Administrative Officer, David Weidler. Welcome, David. Mayor and Council, um, annually we receive funding through the Community Block or Development Block Grant Program, CDBG. The national objectives of the Community Development Block Grant Program are to primarily benefit low and moderate income residents, eliminate slums and blight, and to alleviate urgent, serious, and critical community needs that are of recent origin. The city annually receives $46,800 through this program. What we have done in the past and what we're recommending to do, we do in uh, 2022 with these funds is to place them with other funding from municipalities in St. Louis County, as well as funds received by St. Louis County itself, and to use them for the rehabilitation of private residences administered through the St. Louis County government's home improvement program. St. Louis County Government's Home Improvement Program provides up to $5,000 for approved home repairs for eligible low to moderate income homeowners at no cost. Eligible repair items include furnace air conditioning, roofing, plumbing, electrical, tuck pointing, concrete, asphalt, masonry, hot water heating uh, or heaters, insulation, uh, tree trimming and removal, handrail insulation, retaining, or retaining walls, and foundation work. Um, with that, one of the most frequent questions that we receive is how the program is performing. Recently, I reached out to our community uh, development specialists, and as of June 25th, all funds have been expended for previous years, and there are two current projects that have received approval for 2021. Uh, does the council, Mayor Council have any questions at this time? Thank you, David. Do we have any council uh, questions? All right. Seeing none, do we have anyone wishing... Uh, to speak from the audience on this. There's no one, there are no comments. All right, very good, thank you, Kim. Well, with that, uh, this public hearing is closed and this item will be on our new business agenda on August, is it 19th? That our 19th. Next meeting, mm -hmm. okay, thank you very much. Now we'll go to our second uh, public hearing, which is a request for zoning code, uh, zoning code, excuse me, arrest, request for zoning code text amendments to amend the definition of catering establishment by adding mobile food trucks, push carts, and farmers markets as an accessory use in residential <laughs> districts that would be permitted with standards. Mr. Hessel, do you wish to enter any exhibits into the record? I would, Mayor. I would again offer as Exhibit 1 the affidavit of publication verifying that notice of public hearing appeared in the St. Louis County. Inn. Exhibit 2 is the affidavit of publication verifying that notice of public hearing appeared in the Webster Kirkwood Times. Exhibit 3 is the report of the subcommittee of the Planning and Zoning Commission dated July 7, 2021. And Exhibit 4 is the report of the Planning and Zoning Commission dated July 8, 2021, in which the commission recommended approval of the zoning code text amendments to amend the definition of catering establishment by adding mobile food trucks, push carts, and farmer's markets as accessory use in the residential districts that would be permitted with standards. And Exhibit 5 is the Code of Ordinances of the City of Kirkwood. Thank you, John. Mr. Hus uh, Mr. Haas, who will present this to City Council? Uh, City Planner Amy Lowry. 
Welcome, Amy. Good evening, Mayor and Council, and I'm not going to repeat my title because we've said this many times that this is a amendment to the definition of catering establishments. Um, I just want to go back to the beginning. Um, this text amendment will allow places of worship and educational institutions to rent out their kitchens for use as a commissary. And a commissary under the St. Louis County Food Code means a catering establishment, restaurant, or other place in which food, containers, or supplies are kept, handled, prepared, packaged, or stored for subsequent transport, sale, or service elsewhere. And they also define commissary under their required commissary agreement as a base of operations for all mobile, mobile food units, push carts, and catering businesses. In other words, the county health department requires food from a food truck, a push cart, or being sold at a farmer's market to be prepared in a kitchen that the food establishment returns to daily for food preparation, supplies, cleaning, and servicing operations. So we do already have some commissaries in Kirkwood. For example, the restaurant kitchen at Amigo's Cantina serves as its commissary for its food truck that, that under, goes under the same name. So the commissary kitchen itself would be subject to approval and inspection by the St. Louis County Public Health Department. Grace Episcopal Church has a commercial kitchen that they'd like to rent out to food trucks and caterers for when the church is not using it. Um, in addition to the St. Louis County Public Health requirements, the commercial kitchen would also need to meet our requirements on fire um, and building code and including standards for suppression hoods. Under our current zoning code, we don't allow third party use of the church's kitchen. So Grace Episcopal requested this to be an accessory use for places of worship. The Planning and Zoning Commission also added that as an accessory use for educational institutions given that they, say they have similar institutional purposes. So most places of worship in Kirkwood are located in residential zoning districts. However, there's some churches that are located in R5 multifamily, B2 central business, B3 highway business, and I did find we have one church that's located in the light industrial district. So catering establishments is already a permitted use in all the business and industrial zone districts. Just want to show you Grace Episcopal is um, zoned um, R3 and it's in the middle of a R3 residentially zoned district. It's about a uh, four acre site. The text amendment that is being proposed um, would alter the definition of catering establishment to um, add, oops, sorry, um, that a catering establishment could be used for mobile food trucks, push carts, and farmers markets. Uh, the definition already says that new, no food is going to be sold on the premises, so that would continue to be um, under the definition when and if the church were able to use this. So the first step is to amend the definition of catering establishment to allow for preparation of food for food trucks, push carts, and farmers markets. The second step would be to allow a catering establishment as an accessory use permitted in residentially zoned districts. So this is a table we have in the zoning code for accessory uses, and we would just insert catering establishment in alphabetical order on that table. And the uh, permitted uses, accessory uses, are designated as a use that's permitted, a use that's permitted with standards, or a special use. So the Planning and Zoning Commission decided that um, they would recommend that this be permitted with standards, which means once we establish the standards, if someone came in to apply for this, then it would be up to staff to determine whether they met those standards. But it wouldn't come back through, for, through council as a special use permit. So uh, back to this. So the standards, um, there's a on the table, there's a column where the standards are. And so the next section would be the standards that Planning and Zoning Commission is recommending. And those are, the accessory use would be limited to educational institutions and places of worship. 
It would have to be located in a principal building of a non-residential use. Each catering establishment would have to be licensed with St. Louis County. Each catering establishment would have to get, obtain a commercial occupancy permit and business license through the city. Deliveries and unloading of vehicles would be limited to the hours of 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. No vehicles associated with the catering establishment could be stored overnight at the site of the kitchen. And the exhaust from the kitchen um, could not directly vent onto adjacent residences, or if it was close, we would have the, um, the opportunity to um, make a recommendation that that would include scrubbers. Um, PNZ had discussed whether to limit the number of food trucks or catering establishment for each commissary kitchen, but they decided that the leasing establishment or the church who was renting out the space would have discretion based on the size of the kitchen and each specific food establishment's time and space needs. They also discussed limiting the hours of operation for the kitchen, but again, based on testimony from Grace Episcopal, they decided against those restrictions because sometimes a breakfast food truck may need to be there very early in the morning, or a food truck that might serve dinner would have to come late in the evening for cleanup. But they did put the prohibition of overnight storage of vehicles. And just, I know that there were some comments about delivery and unloading and loading hours. Those were based on the hours of operation allowed in the B1 neighborhood district, business district. So tonight we're having the public hearing and then we'll have first and second reading for council to consider and vote on this. And I'm happy to answer any questions and Pastor Todd McDowell of Grace Episcopal Church is here tonight as well. Before we go to council questions, I'm sorry, before we go to council questions, Pastor, would you like to add anything? Uh, Mr. Mayor and members of council, I uh, just want to introduce myself. I'm Father Todd McDowell from Grace Episcopal Church. We have been a uh, part of the Kirkwood community since 1854, and uh, we have grown with, with Kirkwood. And this commissary kitchen is an important step for all churches where our budgets are getting tighter and more limited. And we found that in the community, there's a great need. We provide uh, food trucks and we provide people at, the, at our wonderful um, market, and yet they don't have a place here in their own city in order to uh, prepare that food legally. Um, the, as Amy mentioned, the um, we have uh, places like Amigos uses, you know, they don't rent out their kitchen to other people. And so uh, we just, it's a win-win situation that we have found. There's other communities, Maplewood and other churches in the Episcopal Church around the state that are using commissary kitchens as a way to supplement because many of our uh, educational institutions and churches already have um, commas, uh, professional kitchens, uh, commercial kitchens. So it's, it's a win-win for both. So I'm here to answer any questions that you may have at any time. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Father. Do we have any uh, council uh, questions or comments? Council Member Ward. Right. Yeah, I had a question for Mr. Hessel um, regarding the issue of, of retailing. Ross, oh, pull your mic forward if you don't mind so we can. I guess you're already wanted to hear me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> A uh, question for Mr. Hessel regarding the reference to retailing of food. In a situation where a third party vendor is providing food for an event at the church, for example, a reception of some kind, would it, it appears this would prohibit them from retailing that? No. No. No? No. Okay. A, again, keep in mind, if. It, if it's part of the church activities, then they're entitled to do so, even if it's a retail. Okay, All right, thank you. Okay, uh, Councilmember Gibbons. Well, I was wondering about the deliveries. Um, is this, would this be like outside deliveries of materials to be used for in the cooking? Um, there would be some deliveries of supplies, yes. Supplies, mm -hmm. okay, and, is that, and that's seven days a week? That's what the ordinance has been drafted to say, yes. And is there any limitation to backup beeping? 
Not currently in the ordinance, no. <laughs> Any other council uh, comments or questions? Council Member Dewey. Um, I also have some issues with the, with the delivery hours. Um, some churches are like the Presbyterian Church is out on Adams. So um, this one is in the middle of neighborhoods. So that beeping and in and out and large trucks and whatever from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., I would not be happy living across the street or even the next street over from that. Anything else from uh, council at this point? Council Mary Gibbons. Well, I'm just wondering if there's a way that there wouldn't be any backup. If, I mean, if they're coming in uh, after a certain time, um, I would think that maybe there's a way that there wouldn't have to be any kind of backup. Yeah, I mean, the, the, most of the churches have pretty large lots, too, so there would be a way to, I mean, if you wanted to put that in the ordinance, they don't have to back up they just pull up to the side of where they're loading or unloading I don't think any of them have a dock so no. they, would, they wouldn't be backing up no there. but all right anything else from council at this point all right do we have any uh, anyone wishing to speak on this matter from the audience mayor there are no comments or requests for comment at this time great thank you any any further uh final comments from uh council all right well with that uh this public hearing is closed and this item will also be on our new business agenda on august 19th thank you amy thank you father all right now we'll move on to uh public comments <coughs> excuse me sorry <clears throat> the public comments portion of the meeting is an opportunity for the City Council to listen to comments from citizens. It is not a question and answer session, and the City Council will not respond to comments or answer questions during this period. The Mayor may refer any matter brought up to the City Council to the Chief Administrative Officer or City Clerk if action is needed. Thank you. Do we have anyone wishing to speak? Mayor, we have one request from uh, David Anderson. David Anderson, 521 Taylor Young Drive. I hope that the reduction in speed limits is not limited to downtown, but extended to the outer boundaries of Kirkwood. I also hope that Kirkwood partners with its neighbors, neighboring communities, and with the county in reducing speed limits and making our streets safer. Safer streets and stable neighborhoods should be a large part of Envision 2035. And here is today's copy of Webster Kirkwood Times for your evaluation and reading and information. And please pay close attention to page six. Thank you, Thank you sir. Any, anyone else wishing to speak? Or is that it? Is that it? Is that the only one, David? I'm that sorry. is the only comment Great. at this time. Mayor. Thank you very much. All right, we will move on now to uh, the consent agenda. And um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move approval. Second. We have a second. Second. Okay. Uh, I know we've had a re I've had a request from Councilmember Gibbons to um, remove item B. Resolution 77 2021 from the consent and move that to new business, uh, which we will do. Um, are there any other comments or questions on the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, all in favor of the consent agenda with item uh, B removed, please say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Consent agenda passes. Give me one second to remove that resolution in my package now we go on to unfinished business bill 10884 mayor and council this is an ordinance granting a special use permit amendment for vehicle sale and rental motor vehicle repair shop major and vehicle wash 
and approving the amended site plan at 10725 Manchester Road, Blue Fuse Toyota, subject to certain conditions. Have any questions or comments? All right, seeing none, roll call please. Mayor Griffin? Yes. Councilmember Ward? Yes. Councilmember Wirtz? Yes. Councilmember Gibbons? Yes. Councilmember Sears? Yes. Councilmember Dewey? Yes. Councilmember Zimmer? Yes. Uh, bill passes second reading. Uh, bill 10885. Mayor and Council, this is an ordinance amending the Kirkwood Code of Ordinances, Chapter 13, Article 2, Section 1334, Subsection C, for itinerant merchants, peddlers, and solicitors, plus any additional administrative costs incurred, including the cost of the criminal record check. Any questions or comments? All right, seeing none, roll call, please. Mayor Griffin? Yes. Councilmember Ward? Yes. Councilmember Wirtz? Yes. Councilmember Gibbons? Yes. Councilmember Sears? Yes. Councilmember Dewey? Yes. Councilmember Zimmer? Yes. Bill passes. Bill 10886. Mayor and Council, this is an ordinance amending the Kirkwood Code of Ordinances, Chapter 14, Article 8, Section 14 396, Schedule F, Speed Limit Designations. Um, any questions or comments from Council? Yeah. Councilmember Ward, yeah. Yeah, a question I, I don't think you'll have it this evening, but I'd, I'd like some idea when the last time we had a general speed limit change within the community and, and what was the impact of that? We're going to do a research uh, uh, for that. I appreciate you letting me know that beforehand. Uh, we're in the process of uh, researching former ordinances uh, where that would occur, and uh, we'll get an answer to you on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments from Council? All right, seeing none, uh, roll call please. Mayor Griffin? Yes. Councilmember Ward? Yes. Councilmember Wirtz? Yes. Councilmember Gibbons? Yes. Councilmember Sears? Yes. Councilmember Dewey? Yes. Councilmember Zimmer? Yes. Uh, bill passes. Move to new business, Bill 10887. Mayor and Council, this is an ordinance readopting a procedure to disclose potential conflicts of interest and substantial interests for certain officials as set forth in Chapter 2, Article 1, Section 2-5 of the Kirkwood Code of Ordinances. Is there a motion for approval? Motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any questions or comments? All right, seeing none, all in favor of first reading, please say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion passes. Bill 10888. Mayor and Council, this is an ordinance amending the Kirkwood Code of Ordinances, Chapter 23, Article 3, Division 2, Section 23-90, Heat Pump, Water Pump Rebate Policy, by deleting it in its entirety. Is there a motion for approval? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Any questions or comments from Council? All right. Seeing none, all in favor of first reading, please say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion passes. Bill 10889. Mayor and Council, this is an ordinance appropriating $153,000 from the Park Improvement Fund Balance to the Capital Expenditure Building and Site Improvement Account, Project Number PR2110 for the Emanager Park Bank Stabilization Project. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any questions or comments on the bill? All right, seeing none, uh, all in favor of first reading, please say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Uh, motion passes. Resolution 76, 2021. Mayor and Council, this is a resolution approving a one year extension to the approval of Resolution 108-2020A, granting site plan approval for lot two of the proposed mixed use subdivision located on the property known as 300. North Kirkwood Road, subject to certain conditions. Is there a motion for approval? Move approval. I have a second? Second. Any questions or comments on the resolution? All right, seeing none, roll call please. Mayor Griffin? Yes. Councilmember Ward? Yes. Councilmember Wirtz? Yes. Councilmember Gibbons? Yes. Councilmember Sears? Yes. Councilmember Dewey? Yes. Councilmember Zimmer? Yes. Resolution passes. Resolution 82, 2021. 
Mayor and Council, this is a resolution accepting the proposal of KCI Construction Company in the not to exceed amount of $265,992, which includes a contingency of $44,332 for environmental services, soil remediation at Emanager Park and the bank stabilization at Emanager Park, and authorizing and directing the mayor to enter into a contract. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any questions or comments on the resolution? All right, seeing none, roll call please. Mayor Griffin? Yes. Councilmember Ward? Yes. Councilmember Wirtz? Yes. Councilmember Gibbons? Yes. Councilmember Sears? Yes. Councilmember Dewey? Yes. Councilmember Zimmer? Yes. Resolution passes. Uh, now the resolution from the consent agenda, resolution 77 2021. Mayor and Council, this is a resolution accepting the bid of Tramar Contracting Incorporated for the amount not to exceed of $72,142.10, which includes a contingency of $6,000. For 2021 acrylic waterborne pavement markings and authorizing and directing the mayor to enter into a contract. Is there a motion for approval? Motion. Approval. Motion and Council of Wars is a second. Um, questions or comments? Councilmember Gibbons, I'll go to you first since you asked for it to be removed. Um, my biggest concern is crosswalks, and I'm wondering if this includes crosswalk painting. And if it does, I think we need something more durable than what we currently are using, and I don't know if what we're currently using is this waterborne or not. It does include crosswalks. Uh, it's a striping for uh, all the striping projects in the city. Uh, this is a waterborne acrylic. It is, and I, I'm speaking not firsthand knowledge here, but my understanding is that this material is the newer of the painting applications that we have applied in the past few years. Uh, we've tried some other materials that weren't as effective. So what you're seeing that is deteriorating really quickly is uh, not the waterborne acrylic from my understanding. What this is is a consensus among uh, engineers and municipalities in this area that this is the most cost effective and efficient way of, uh, and effective way of painting streets uh, for crosswalks, street markings, and, and other purposes. So um, I can give you a little bit of information from our uh, city engineer who forwarded me this. There are alternatives to waterborne acryl acrylic paint that is specified for this project, such as epoxy paint or an even more expensive thermoplastic. And you'll see thermoplastic in some places. However, there are a number of drawbacks to these to uh, these paints. There is a limited number of pavement marking contractors that do epoxy paint. Uh, an investigation was done among other cities in the St. Louis area, and the consensus was to paint from waterborne acrylic paint with more painting frequency. So as it fades, you just update it more and more, uh, completing striping on an annual basis, and that's what Kirkwood is working toward. Uh, as there are a lot of street resurfacing projects up and coming, the increased cost to go to a higher specification of pavement marking makes cost efficiencies lower. Therefore, we would be able to do less striping than we would be able to do with this material. Uh, the biggest thing in this, and this is according to the city's engineer, is the cost efficiency. In his investigation, the larger scope striping project, the larger the scope of the striping project, the lower the unit price is and the more of the city we can stripe more frequently. That's what I have right now. And you said this is what we've been using for the past three years? No. Is that correct? Okay. No, I believe this is what we've been using for the past, the most recent application, which you will see if you look out on Madison, uh, the redone crosswalks there. Madison at Clay, those were most recently done with this material, uh, as were some other areas in the city. I believe that Kirkwood Road, the white that lines the brickwork, is the same material as well. 
the faux brickwork. It's not real brickwork. <laughs> it's stamping. It's stamping in asphalt. I don't want people to think, oh, those are actually bricks that we're driving on. No, it's stamped asphalt. And so, and I, I'm sorry, they're saying that this waterborne is um, superior to the epoxy and the thermal plastics. Not at all. Plastics. Oh, no. Okay. I, not in wearability. Not it's superior only in the aspect of cost efficiency. Wearability of thermoplastic or uh, viewability of thermoplastic is higher. Uh, but it's very expensive to apply. Therefore, with the funding that we have allocated, much less of the city would be done. This is the most efficient and effective means for all of the striping in the city, and we have lots of crosswalks and so forth, to refresh them on a yearly basis with this material is determined by consensus amongst other engineers and by our own engineer that this is the most efficient and effective way to do that. Well, I'm concerned about, you know, I've been watching one crosswalk um, on Clay mm -hmm. at Bodley. Oh, sorry. Um, at Clay and Bodley. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with this pandemic, time just doesn't um, I'm not good with it. It's something that seems like it was six months ago was actually a year and a half ago. So, but I don't think it's been in very long, and it is worn. I mean, I think it's been in six months, and it is worn. You can't you can't even see it now. Um, so I can't say for certain that that was this newer material that we're working with. Okay, That's I'd like to know if it is or not. Mm -hmm. Oh, Chris is here. I didn't realize Chris was here. Oh. <laughs> I mean, here I am reading your statement. <laughs> You're free to make your own statement, Chris. <laughs> Chris, he's the chief administrative officer. I'm the mayor, just so you know. <laughs> That's an inside joke. <laughs> mayor and city council. Um, so the, the specific crosswalk you're speaking of, uh, we did do paving last year on clay and Bodley. Mm -hmm. um, we saw a lot of our crosswalks and striping that we painted right after doing our paving um, did bleed. Um, and that's very typical um, right after a pavement project. Um, speaking with other municipalities, they typically stripe twice after they do a paving project. Mm -hmm. um, and so that uh, it is included on our list to go back to that specific crosswalk to repaint that. So it was the waterborne, but it was because it's not sticking or whatever. Because yeah. So when you re repave a street, there's a lot of oils that that bleed through, and uh, when you have new pavement markings, that oil bleeds through very quickly. Um, and then just one other point um, with COVID, a lot of our downtown crosswalks were not painted last year. And so this year we're making uh, a big effort to repaint all the downtown crosswalks. So if you're looking at all those downtown crosswalks, uh, it's been almost two years going on three years since those have been painted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. any, any other questions? Councilmember Board, I know I thought I had a question. Glad to see you here, Chris. <laughs> um, <laughs> So th there weren't any bid alternatives in in this bidding. We just went for the one correct water-based paint. Any reason why it's it's no cost to have alternates in there? Um, what the the research that I did on it, um, we've we know what those alternatives are. Uh, we know that there's a paint shortage. Um, there's due to COVID. Um, there's uh, also there's specific application rates um, that you can put it down as. Uh, during my research uh, and talking with other cities, it's been more cost effective uh, to, to not up those application rates um, and to paint more frequently uh, rather than try to put like five more mils of paint uh, during one application. Okay, so the material that we're, that we're looking at on this contract is only to be used on crosswalks? No, sir. It is. It, it is be used uh, on lawn striping. Lawn also. striping, bicycle symbols, uh, 
bike uh, arrows. Uh, so when we look at life cycle costing, the, the crosswalks, because the wear directly on them is, is, is much higher than it would be for the long striping. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if, if a, a, a closer look at a more expensive paint with higher durability gives us a, a better life cycle cost than, than what we were using on our uh, long striping, assuming that a, a lot of this would be used in-house for our own application rather than third party. Um, what I, I guess what I'll speak to that is m most of the, we don't own equipment that will do long striping. Uh, it's only stop bars and crosswalks uh, that we can do in-house. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and the more that we can in in put in the contract for long line striping, the more, the better unit price we can get. Okay, so we would typically, what percentage of our crosswalks do you think we can do in-house in a year? I know uh, that's a big question. Right? <laughs> yeah, I would, it, our street department has uh, done all of the downtown crosswalks and crosswalks near schools. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what they've set out to do. Uh, and the crosswalks that is included in this contract uh, are not, are is ex exclusive of, of those. Okay. Not including I, those. Well, and the reason I'm asking that is, and I don't want to belabor this for you, but um, if we can't cycle through the entire city in a two-year span, then we're, we're deficient in our crossing because I, of where. They, they wouldn't be, they would no longer be effective if we're unable to do that. Correct. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. I, I think we'll, once we, uh, if we get more funding, uh, we can stripe everything and be in a, a good situation. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Council Member Sears, I know you had your hand Yeah, up. I just wanted to clarify the way I understood it that you, read your words or his words I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know where, I don't know where they where the where they it came from but the way I understood it was that this isn't necessarily the superior product but when you balance to make it equal those other products you would do more frequent applications right so it's correct. it it loses on the durability comparison to the others but it's otherwise legitimate safe and everything yes. but you just have to to apply it more often which yes. makes sense um, as part of the calculation for overall costs yes sir so. to council member wards and gibbons questions about durability and how fast with the crosswalks, is it done? I mean, is it planned out, or do we do you often get, you know, I wouldn't call them complaints, but questions? Hey, the crosswalk at such and such and such and such is faded. I mean, is that the type of request that could be acted on outside of your normal uh, normal schedule? If someone brings it to the atten your attention? Yes, oh, definitely. Um, we use we can use contingency um, if it's not already included in the scope of the project. Okay. What would you what would, what would you say cost the cost of a just a regular crosswalk would be? So there's street? there's a couple different types of crosswalks the city has. Um, like you want a clay and bodley, just for example. Clay and bodley is a two transverse, twelve inch lines. Yeah. Um, typically, that's a. I want to say it's. A, without going into the contract, I want to no. say it's about a hundred to two hundred dollars to okay. to paint. Gotcha. So it's the kind of thing that if any of us or a citizen notices a crosswalk that, you know, yes. no, no problem calling and saying, hey, the crosswalk here and there. And it, there's reasonable assumption that at some point it, it could get done rather, mm -hmm. rather quickly, whatever that means. Yes, with this contract. Okay. Mm -hmm. Council Member Gibbons. How is it determined what kind of crosswalk is put where? where? And the reason I, one reason I ask is the one on Clay and Bodley, in my opinion, first time I went over it I was like is this a crosswalk I really wasn't sure if it was a crosswalk or not and there's another one up at clay and jewel which has the what do you call them when it's the box so, so the other type of crosswalk is a continental crosswalk yeah. 
or and ladder that has style. A, that has a continental, and to me, it's more visible, it's more identifiable as a crosswalk, mm -hmm. and that area is less busy as far as cars go than Clay, I, than, uh, Clay and Bodley. So how's it determined? Uh, so it's a, right now it's been a case-by-case -case basis. Um, typically, if it's a mid-block that doesn't have any, uh, it's not near an intersection um, and not near a school. Uh, um, I'm sorry, if it's near an intersection and not at a school, it would be two transverse lines. And then, if it, or if it's a mid-block or near a school, we would be painting the, the ladder style which is a continental crosswalk. A continental. So really, Clay and Bodley should have a continental because it's mid. So is that considered mid? Technically, that would be at Bodley. So that would be at an intersection. Um, uh, but there is not a stop. It's not a stop condition. Um, so it w would be considered a, um, a mid block where you don't have a stop condition there. It's not a fully controlled intersection, is basically what he's saying. It's, it's only stop in one direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's only a stop sign on Bodley mm -hmm. and yeah. um, not on Clay. Yeah, which, which is the same at Jewel and Clay. But it's got the Continental. Is it, is it less expensive to do the Continental? I mean, more expensive to do the Continental? Yes, that there's that? more paint that goes Why? into. So how much money are we talking between the Striped and the Continental? Uh, I'd have to, I don't know off the top of my head. So if it's a hundred or two hundred for, well, I, yeah, you're it, probably looking me at me. It wouldn't be the cost. It'd be you know, what the engineers are saying is the ration the rationale or the standards for where to put a certain type of crosswalk. Is that yeah, right? and and there's no uh, national guidance on um, mm -hmm. as far as where to put a continental crosswalk and where to put a you know, a transverse line crosswalk um, that and I'm aware of. I wondered if Vision Zero, do they actually give you specifics uh, like that at all, or is it nothing? Some, but... Some, but yeah, but not like a whole chart of yeah. it. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah it's, it's something that we could maybe determine uh -huh. citywide what yeah. we want to do in Kirkwood. Correct. Mm -hmm. Of what we would do here, yeah. but nationally it's, there isn't. Yeah. All right. Do we have any other questions Absolutely. or comments from council on this? All right, seeing none, thank you, Chris. Thanks. <laughs> thank, thank you, Chris. All right, with that, uh, roll call on the resolution. Mayor Griffin? Yes. Councilmember Ward? Yes. Councilmember Wirtz? Yes. Councilmember Gibbons? Yes. Councilmember Sears? Yes. Councilmember Dewey? Yes. Councilmember Zimmer? Yes. Uh, resolution passes. Uh, I'll go to city council reports. I just want to, I'll start by just uh, announcing to the public and media residents, everyone, that uh, for the foreseeable future, beginning with August 19th, all city, Kirkwood City Council meetings, public hearings, et cetera, will be done via Zoom. They will not be in person. Uh, due to some of the, just so much confusion, uncertainty over mask mandates, who has authority um, over everything, I, after consultation with uh, Chief Administrative Hawes and City Attorney Hessel, I made the decision to do that. In addition, starting next week, uh, Board and Commissions will also be meeting via, via Zoom. Uh, and I'm going to ask, uh, there's a lot of things that went into this decision, but I'm going to ask City Attorney Hessel to uh, make a few comments on it, please. Thanks, Mayor. Um, obviously, it's very unfortunate that we find ourselves in this state of what I've characterized as mask confusion. <laughs> obviously, people feel very strongly about the mask mandate, both for and against. Throughout this pandemic, I have advised the staff, the mayor and council, that these public health issues are, in fact, county issues led by the director of public health of St. Louis County, as prescribed by state statute. Um, and we have continued to follow that recommendation. Recently, the, as we all know, the St. Louis County Director of Health made a decision to impose a mask mandate. County Executive acted accordingly. County Council disagreed with that decision. And as of Tuesday, this mandate was put on a temporary hold by a judge in St. Louis County. 
I continued to advise the city that this is really a county issue and this is the problem that we have and that is because St. Louis County has such divergent views on this mask mandate. As the mayor mentioned, Russ Hawes, the mayor and I have had several long discussions about what to do about the current status that we find ourselves in. Our goal is to avoid getting stuck in the middle of a fight between the counter, county director of health and the county council. Um, the mayor's decision to resume the Zoom meetings was not made lightly. I suggest that there will be no right decision in the eyes of everyone, but clearly the statistics show that this pandemic um, is not over and the challenge is once again upon us to do what we can to protect each other as well as the general public and I suggest that it's also an effort to avoid confrontation um, between those people on each side of the mask mandate decision side so uh, the decision was made to avoid that kind of a confusion and confrontation was to go back to meeting by Zoom. It has certainly been effective over the last, what, year and a half. So that's how we got there. Um, and I hope that everyone understands and appreciates the decision that was made. Thank you, John. And I, I'm just, because David Anderson is here, I, he and I have communicated regarding the public hearing. I just want you to know, David, we've had over the last year and a half, big public hearings over Zoom. So we had the uh, Kirkwood Flats. So I, I don't want, in any way shape or form not that you were doing that but since you're here to know that we we have done this and everyone will get his or her opportunity to speak and um, so i just want since you're here i just wanted to say that personally to you yes sir um, any other uh, council comments or questions or not questions <laughs> council comments yeah, no questions now <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, seeing none, Chief Administrative Officer report. Yes, sir, Mayor. Uh, the city has received an application for a liquor license to sell intoxicating liquor by the drink plus Sunday from the High Point Drive-In, 951 South Kirkwood Road. The application needs City Council approval by a voice vote. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Any questions or comments? All right. Uh, seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed say no. All right. Motion passes. Anything else, Russ? No, that's all I have, Mayor. All right. City Attorney report. I would like to mention, as I informed the Mayor and City Council and staff, that on Wednesday um, an order was entered um, allowing us to move forward with the citywide TDD approving the petition that was filed and ordering that the ballot question be placed on the November ballot. So it has gone through the process and it's now up to the voters to decide in November whether or not we will in fact create a citywide TDD. Thank you very much, John. Thanks for the work you and all your uh, uh, comrades uh, did on this. I know Appreciate it was a that. lot, a lot of work. Thank you. Uh, city clerk report. Yes, Your Honor. I have a few items. First, I'll start. I have two reports from the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. So I'll start with the July 26th report. I mean, sorry, at the July 21st report, um, the following action was taken. The commission unanimously recommended approval of the request to rezone 250 Commerce Avenue from R4 to RMM. Uh, the item will be scheduled for a public hearing, which I'll report on here in a moment. Um, the commission, by a vote of four to five, recommended denial of application submitted by Harmony Homes for a special use permit for a nursing home and site plan review at 600 North Ballast Road. The item will also be scheduled for a public hearing, which I will report on. I also have the report of the August 4th meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. The following action was taken after a presentation by staff and the applicant of the final site plan for the James, a mixed use development in the B2 zoning district at 426 North Kirkwood Road and a final site plan for a temporary bank building at 128 West Washington. Commissioners Klippel, Eagleton and Atkins were appointed to a subcommittee. The subcommittee is scheduled to meet on August 10th at 8.30 a.m. And 
for the scheduled upcoming public hearings, um, which will be held via Zoom. First is August 19th, 2021. We will have establishing the property tax rates for the city of Kirkwood, um, establishing the property tax rates for the municipal Kirkwood Municipal Library, and the request to rezone 250 Commerce Avenue from R4 to RMM. We also have scheduled for August 26, 2021, a for a special city council meeting for this public hearing, a request for a special use permit for a nursing home and site plan review at 600 North Ballast Road, Harmony Homes. And that's all I have, Your Honor. Thank you. And regarding that public hearing on August 26th, you, you will be sending out new cards to the uh, people so they know that it will not yes. be via Zoom and so I will be person. sending out new cards for the August 19th public hearing for the request to rezone 250 Commerce Avenue. We'll send out revised cards notifying um, the residents within 300 feet who receive those cards of the change in location, as well as new cards for. Um, Harmony Homes for August 26. Great. Thank you very much. All right. The next meeting of the City Council will be on August 19th, 7 p.m. p.m. via Zoom. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>